NerdRotic.com. Decades come and go, but entertainment is forever, or so they thought. Hollywood used to be where dreams come true, but now it's where dreams go to die. Welcome to Nerdrotic, and this is the Top 5 Murdered Franchises. Yeah, take it away, Ernie! It's going to be a bumpy ride! <laughs> For this list, we're going to go over the Top 5 Blockbuster Genre Franchises, in most cases that brought generations of fans together, of all makes, shapes, and sizes. Franchises that have been vandalized, subverted, and perverted by corporate culture in a never-ending quest to turn art into content. This wasn't an easy list to put together, but we broke it down to this. What franchise committed the worst crimes against imagination? And we start with number five, The Terminator. Come with me if you want to live. Some may argue that The Terminator was never a franchise and only a vehicle for Arnold Schwarzenegger written by James Cameron for two films, and you may be right. After two groundbreaking films, it's been nothing but mediocre. Talk to the hand. A somewhat below average third film with Terminator Rise of the Machines, an interesting attempt with Terminator Salvation, oh, da, 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 good for you. god awful Terminator Genesis. -y. Genesis, Genesis, fight me. That is a very immature response. At that point, how much worse could it get? <laughs> this brings us to the franchise killer Terminator Dark Fate, which on paper looked like it could have been a hit. Tim Miller, the director of Deadpool, was on board. Arnold Schwarzenegger was coming back. The triumphant return of Linda Hamilton as Sarah Connor. Plus, this film came with more than just a blessing from James Cameron. He wrote the story, with a script co-written by Dark Knight's David S. Goyer. What could possibly have gone wrong? It starts with the relatively recent phenomenon of alienating half your audience by calling them misogynists, followed by the promise of a feminist Terminator film, then the unfortunate release of the first image of the film, which turned into an instant meme. And then things got worse. The film was released. <laughs> Terminator Dark Fate was just a soft reboot, meaning they just remade Terminator 1 and Terminator 2 and race and gender swapped everyone, while bringing in an old familiar character generally to abuse as nostalgia bait. Edward Furlong returned only to be de-aged and killed in the first minutes of the film, only to be quickly replaced by Natalia Reyes, the new ethnically diverse leader of the resistance. We have a new part human, part Terminator protector, Justin Bieber, a brand new Terminator, the Pee Wee 1000. <laughs> Linda Hamilton returns as the bitter anti-natalist Sarah Connor. And I drink till I black out. So this is um, mouthwash? Toothbrush? This your breath is not um, pretty. Arnold Schwarzenegger returns as the T-800 Terminator named Carl, who's in a platonic relationship and a stand-in for Schrodinger's rapist. I do drapes. Legion replaces Skynet and somehow got all their patents. Mix in identity politics, intersectional feminist themes, immigration allegories, domestic abuse allegories, and you have a dumpster fire at the box office, a dead franchise, and a humbled director. I won't be back. Number four, Game of Thrones. He won't be a boy forever, and winter is coming. After the box office and award-winning success of Lord of the Rings proving that fantasy could be financially viable, HBO decided to take a chance on the unfinished A Song of Ice and Fire book series by George R.R. R. Martin, setting out to subvert the tropes of Tolkien. High fantasy with subverted expectations, random character deaths, political intrigue, ice zombies, dragons, boobs, and lots of sex. See you at sundown. Close the door! Close the door! It wasn't long before HBO had a cultural phenomenon on their hands. Game of Thrones looked unstoppable. Lots of Emmys, watch parties around the globe. Da, 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 da. A thousand YouTube channels spawned to theorize and react, and it became the most watched and illegally downloaded show on the planet. Pivotal moments like the death of Ned Stark, the Red Wedding, the Purple Wedding. What could possibly go wrong? Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet. 
It doesn't help when the author of the story your series is based on can either take part in, rewrite, and sometimes write 28 books during the eight years your series ran but couldn't produce the two books needed to finish it properly. <laughs> Along with blogging about the Giants, blogging about movies, blog about entertainment, blogging about the election, blogging about not finishing the Winds of Winter, buying a movie theater, buying a train. Then there's David Benioff and D.B. Weiss, who are now collectively called by the fandom Dumb and Dumber. After passing the source material and characters getting plot armor where they never had it before, the introduction of the Westeros Express... Despite the flaws of seasons 5 through 7, Dan and Dave were on top of the world. They had Netflix deals. They had deals with Disney Star Wars. People started to speculate that Dan and Dave had no idea what they were doing, something they would later admit to, and that became pretty clear with Game of Thrones Season 8. A season filled with everything except a story. Male characters who survived the series only to needlessly commit suicide, like Jamie Lannister and the Hound. Jon Snow back from the dead as the lost Targaryen and possibly the prophesized Azor a high and a king of the north reduced to a manservant the show clearly being affected by the me too times up era in hollywood mary sue aria who was able to wipe out the male line of the phrase and kill the mighty night king in his first stop in westeros <laughs> in an episode that nobody could see. Cersei drinking wine in front of a window for three seasons. Dumb Tyrion. <laughs> Spurging out murderous Daenerys. And a season that ends in complete disaster. Best season ever! <laughs> What followed was a petition to remake season 8, fan blaming by the actors, Dan and Dave losing their jobs at Disney Star Wars, George R. R. Martin distancing himself, HBO canceling a $30 million prequel, and an HBO desperate to recapture the magic which will be impossible. Good luck, House of the Dragon. Number 3, Star Trek. Live long and prosper. Gene Roddenberry's utopian vision of the future is one of the longest-running franchises of all time, showing that humanity can get over its differences, seek out new life and civilizations, and boldly go where no one has gone before. From iconic characters like Kirk, Spock, and McCoy to Picard, Data, and Riker, Janeway, Seven of Nine, and Chakotay, to Captain Sisko, Lieutenant Dax, and Worf, a series that set out to be a western in space turned out to be one of the most groundbreaking television shows of all time in the pinnacle of science fiction. So after five series, an animated series, and 10 films, it was time to take a little hiatus after spending some time in developmental hell due to some split rights issues. So what puts this show on our list? Well, when it was time to bring the show back, the only logical decision was to give it to somebody who never liked Star Trek. What? As someone who was never a fan of Star Trek, um... And Jar Jar Abrams, who we like to call around these parts the destroyer of franchises, wasted no time in trying to make Star Trek something it wasn't. Star Wars. And in the first film, he actually managed to pull that off, but it was something of a novelty. After a second financially successful film that was despised by most of the fandom, and a third film that flopped, and then went ahead and tried to develop a fourth film. In the meantime, all hope was not lost because Star Trek was returning to television under the tutelage of former Star Trek writer Brian Fuller, who was quickly usurped by the lesser talented version of Jar Jar Abrams, Alex Kurtzman. And at this time, the rights were split. The film rights belonged to Paramount, the television rights belonged to CBS, who decided to start their tenure by suing fans and some issues with borrowing without permission from other intellectual properties. Now only known as Kurtzman Trek, Star Trek used to be a series that inspired astronauts, scientists, and doctors, and now it only inspires what's left of the fandom to seek psychiatric help. 
The once optimistic vision of the future has turned into a dystopian soap opera run by a foul-mouthed incompetent matriarchy. Sheer f***ing hubris. Shut the f*** up. Alex Kurtzman's production company Secret Hideout goes through showrunners like Spinal Tap goes through drummers. There's Star Trek Discovery featuring Spock's secret foster sister and Space Jesus Michael Burnham, a foster sister Spock couldn't mention because she was classified. An insufferable Mary Sue time-traveling Iron Woman, supported by a forgettable cast that looked like it walked out of a toothpaste commercial. Season 2 featured an emotionally damaged and dyslexic Paul McCartney Spock, who sings... Short in matters, vegetable, animal, and mineral. You are the very model of the modern major general. <laughs> Stop! Stop! But that's not the worst of it. Then there's the last Jedi of Star Trek, Picard. It's one thing to commit character assassination with the third actor who played Spock. It's a whole different situation to commit character suicide by the person who made Captain Picard iconic, Patrick Stewart. Oh, I thought that I looked... Appropriately sinister. Shut the f up. An incompetent and xenophobic federation, a brand new crew where every single character has a tortured past. Initially, there were to be no returning Next Generation characters at the behest of Patrick Stewart, the executive producer. Horrific writing. She's a girl. <laughs> I don't think you understand just how much it sucked to be your kid. <laughs> Terrible ship designs, a very awkward and inappropriate love story between Data and Picard, a girl who's the key to everything, and by the end, Picard dies and is replaced by an exact robot copy of himself. And what you have is one of the worst television series ever produced. There's also Star Trek Lower Decks, which is just Star Trek Rick and Morty, and a repurposed kids show called Prodigy. And what used to be introspective, groundbreaking television has turned into torture horror, and violence, and lots and lots of crying. The worst possible thing that can happen to Star Trek is for Alex Kurtzman to make more of it. And ultimately, what you have is Star Trek, made by people who don't know anything about Star Trek, for people who don't like Star Trek. I don't understand what you did. Number two, Star Wars. The Force will be with you, always. From the genius mind of George Lucas, Star Wars would become a worldwide phenomenon in the late 70s and early 80s. Han, Luke, Leia, and Darth Vader would all become household names. While this series did not invent the Hollywood blockbuster, it would solidify it as Hollywood's future and maximize what would be the most lucrative part of the Hollywood blockbuster, merchandising. Followed by a successful prequel trilogy that was not universally loved at the time but would capture the imagination of another generation. Then the unthinkable happened. George Lucas sold Star Wars in October of 2012. And the franchise that survived so much found something it couldn't. Disney. Fans can expect a new feature film, Star Wars Episode 7, in theaters worldwide in 2015. Initially, things looked more than promising prior to the sale. George Lucas not only had treatments for episodes 7, 8, and 9, he had Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, and Harrison Ford under contract. And the final piece to the puzzle, hiring prolific producer and longtime Steven Spielberg associate Kathleen Kennedy to head Lucasfilm. What could possibly go wrong? The answer is almost everything. Kathleen Kennedy started her reign by shutting down LucasArts and canceling the wildly popular Extended Universe. She followed that decision up by hiring Jar Jar Abrams to direct The Force Awakens hot off the heels of destroying the Star Trek franchise. Things looked good in the beginning, but this ended up being fool's gold. And the architects of Star Wars Destruction, Bob Iger, Kathleen Kennedy, Jar Jar Abrams, and Rianne Johnson got to work and produced the abomination known as the Disney Trilogy. The Force Awakens was a very successful, soft reboot of A New Hope. Made the redeemed hero of Generations Han Solo a regressive bad dad playing Dude Where's My Millennium Falcon only to walk into the lightsaber of his emo son. Followed by the worst sequel of all time, The Last Jedi, directed by Rian Johnson, <laughs> who set out to subvert our expectations, which he absolutely did. We expected a good film, and he delivered a dumpster fire, completing the vandalization of the true female hero of Star Wars, Princess Leia, who was demoted 
converted into an incompetent General Mary Poppins and utterly obliterated the true hero of Generations, Luke Skywalker, who bravely defeated darkness with mercy, only to be turned into a creepy, abusive uncle who quit on the Jedi, quit on his family and the galaxy, moved to an island, drank out of a boob, got his butt kicked by a Mary Sue version of himself, and then OD'd on the Force. Look on a mask of my boy. Then there was the third and final film, The Rise of Skywalker, almost completing the assassination of all the classic characters by bringing back Palpatine and destroying the redemption of Anakin Skywalker. Both Kathleen Kennedy and Jar Jar Abrams came up with the genius idea of not putting Han, Luke, and Leia together in a single scene, committing the worst crime against imagination and the biggest mistake in cinematic history. Bob Iger and Kathleen Kennedy, in their infinite wisdom, decided to replace these classic characters with Mary Sue Luke Skywalker with Teats, a poor man's Han Solo generic character person, and Finn, quite frankly, the most intriguing character who they turned into a clown and shrunk on the poster for China, and a laundry list of characters you wanted to forget or did forget. In and around the abysmal Disney trilogy, Kathleen Kennedy couldn't stop making mistakes. George Lucas's treatments for episodes 7, 8, and 9 were trashed, admitting they never had a plan. There's nothing more important than knowing where you're going. JJ pitched me the film and was like, oh yeah, Palpatine's granddaddy. And I was like, awesome. And then two weeks later, he was like, oh, we're not sure. So it kept changing. Turn the Force female, fired directors, canceled films, Lucasfilm employees attacking fans, Lucasfilm directors attacking fans, leading to a worldwide fan movement known as the Fandom Menace, hiring Harvey Weinstein's former assistant, Leslie Headland, snatching defeat out of the jaws of victory by firing Gina Carano and creating a second fan movement known as the Rebellion, and ruining little baby Yoda and digital Luke Skywalker with the book of Boba Fett. Not to say Kathleen Kennedy isn't thorough, there are still two more characters she can destroy, Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi. So of course you renew the contract of the woman who was gifted the greatest single blockbuster franchise of all time that could have lived forever, slapped an expiration date on it, and turned it into a category on a fledgling streaming service. Before we get to our worst victim of franchise aside, honorable mentions. James Bond, whose ultimate sacrifice to the Me Too Time's Up era in Hollywood was walking into a missile. The Matrix, one good film out of four does not make you a franchise. The Predator, which barely missed our list. Alien, just like with Terminator 2, sometimes a franchise can be co-murdered by one of its creators. He-Man, who was brought down with lies, betrayal, and a bait and switch. Ghostbusters, the true innovator of making the fandom your enemy, who only missed our list because it belongs to the one studio who finally admitted that they made a mistake. Unfortunately, there is one franchise that is worse off than Disney Star Wars. Number one, Doctor Who. This is a scale model of war. When you fire that first shot, no matter how right you feel, you have no idea who's going to die. You don't know whose children are going to scream and burn. How many hearts will be broken? How many lives shattered? How much blood will spill until everybody does what they were always going to have to do from the very beginning? Sit down and talk! A franchise spanning nearly 60 years woven into the DNA of an entire country. A television show that is quintessentially British and a worldwide sensation. Featuring the single most unique titular character in pop culture history, the emblematic Doctor with a somewhat malleable continuity for over 50 years, with one of the greatest television themes of all time. <laughs> 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 
After its initial 26 seasons, it went on hiatus until 1996 with the failed pilot episode on Fox. Then in 2005, it received one of the greatest revivals of a television show of all time and is the longest running science fiction show of all time. And after finally breaking through in America, reached peak popularity on its 50th anniversary. Just as there are fixed points in time in Doctor Who, there are fixed points in its canon. The Doctor is a Time Lord from Gallifrey who pilots the TARDIS, a character who regenerated 12 times, but it was that unlucky 13th that finally did it in. After years of rumors that weren't taken very seriously, they finally did it. The BBC, Pierce Wenger, and new showrunner Chris Chimnall took the well-established male character that was the Doctor for 55-plus years and transitioned him into a woman. In the summer of 2017, they introduced the first female Doctor played by Jodie Whittaker, famously known as Dr. Karen. And for a minute, it looked like it might have worked. The first female Doctor played by Jodie Whittaker's premiere episode was one of the highest rated in the show's history. Unfortunately, it was all downhill from there. The first female Doctor played by Jodie Whittaker and Chris Chimno were given every chance to succeed, moving the show from prime time on Saturday to a better time slot on Sunday. It still didn't help that they saddled the first female Doctor played by Jodie Whittaker with plots filled with identity politics and intersectional feminism. Pregnant. Boys give birth to boys and girls give birth to girls. That's how it is. Jodie Whittaker also put herself behind the eight ball by disrespecting the audience and admitting she didn't do any research. The only thing that makes great stories are stories that people can relate to and they feel represented within. <laughs> to only see TV shows or films from one very specific demographic is... It's got old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so for all of us, it just, you know, it is... Stop raising! We don't serve... After seeing episodes about racism, environmentalism, and Donald Trump, the fans had had enough, and that began a ratings decline that would not recover. Doctor Who had most certainly seen its ups and downs, but nothing like this. Just like with Star Trek and Star Wars, a fan revolt began. The BBC ignored the concerns of the fandom. Jodie Whittaker and Chris Chibnall would echo the sentiments of Piers Wenger, the BBC drama controller, who stated that Doctor Who was no longer entertainment, but it was written to create conversations. What makes Doctor Who number one and a very unique situation is what happened next. You could forget that there were any Terminator films after Terminator 2. You could forget about Game of Thrones because the book series will... Oh, maybe that's not a very good point. You could forget that there's any Star Trek after 2005, and you can forget there's any Star Wars after Return of the Jedi. What Doctor Who fans can't forget is the timeless children. Look upon my work, Doctor. In a voiceover montage lasting a few short minutes, the Doctor was no longer a Time Lord from Gallifrey and William Hartnell was no longer the first Doctor. What? If you could bring any character back on the show, who would it be and why? I'd bring back yep. William Hartnell, who played the first Doctor in 1963. One day, I shall come back. Yes, I shall come back. Until then... There must be no regrets, no tears, no anxieties. Just go forward in all your beliefs and prove to me that I am not mistaken in mine. I'd bring him back and go, Look at this! Look, still going! <laughs> We're all going. We're all still here. Is he here? <laughs> I'm going to have a go at drawing um, the first doctor here. This is William Hartnell. He was strange and nippy. And when I was a child, I absolutely loved him. He was and is Doctor Who. Now the first Doctor is a little black girl abandoned at a portal who would later pleasantly fall to her death.
After having a very diverse regeneration, she would have more very diverse regenerations through being murdered repeatedly by her scientist explorer adopted mother who would culturally appropriate her powers and use it to invent the Time Lords. After that, the show was broken, R.I.P. Doctor Who started to trend, and in a shortened season due to an unspecified virus from an unspecified origin, the first female Doctor played by Jodie Whittaker and Chris Chimno were given the boot, oh, correction, decided to leave, and the BBC were forced to relinquish control of a series they had for almost six decades. And Jodie Whittaker, who started her reign as the first female Doctor, would end it in an era where we can't define a female. It's gonna be shit. I'm officially done. Bye, Doctor Who. <laughs> There you have it, the top five murdered blockbuster franchises. Five beloved franchises woven into the tapestry of our modern mythology. Assassinated by the usual suspects, greed, hubris, and ego. With accomplices that are relatively a new phenomenon in entertainment. Corporatism, intersectional feminism, identity politics, and activism. All leading to taking the stories we love that brought us together and turning them into tools of division so they can be unceremoniously sacrificed on the altar of agenda. Did you agree with our list? Please tell us in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and hit that bell for notifications. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now. Nerderotic.com, please subscribe.